Good evening, New York, and, and welcome to the Public Advocate Office and Beta NYC Fireside Chat on Democracy and Access, which is a part of our ongoing initiative and engagement series called the People's Tech Assemblies, where we look to lift up the voice and narratives of New Yorkers and the issues that they're facing here in New York City to better advocate for them and collaboratively come up with the solutions that are going to be equitable and inclusive uh, for New York City moving forward. It's my great honor to introduce our panel, but also our, our moderator who's going to do all the heavy lifting today. So without further ado, I will pass it over to you, Noel. Hello, everybody. Um, I My name is Noel, or Noel. Um, he, him are my pronouns. I'm the executive director of Beta NYC. Uh, and tonight we're having a conversation about democracy, what it is and what we think it should be for the 21st century. Uh, as John gave in his intro introduction, the Office of the Public Advocate and Beta NYC, along with seven other partners, seek to listen, learn, and develop recommendations on how technology, data, and innovation can improve New York City. Through an ongoing listening process, we are engaging New Yorkers to document their needs and outline collective goals, values, and recommendations. You can access this at People's Tech, that's plural, People's Tech.nyc. So, as we are living through this unprecedented era uh, where democracy seems to be under attack from every which way and public trust in our federal government is low, um, and that there are 5.5 million registered individuals who could vote in New York City, but yet less than a million of them voted for the mayor. Tonight, we want to ask the question, how can New Yorkers come together to model a truly inclusive democracy? Our guests um, are the public advocate, Jumani Williams, who's running a little bit late, um, and then uh, Keisha Gaskins Nathan, the director of democratic practice from the Rockefeller Brothers Fund, and Jamala from the Manhattan Borough President. I'm sorry, from the uh, Public Advocates Office. Um, can we have the three, two of you, give an introduction? Sure. Thanks so much, Noel. Um, it's great to be here with you, Jamila, and we're super excited when Jamani gets here as well. Um, my name is Keisha Gaskins Nathan. I direct the Democratic Practice Program for the United States um, here at the Rockefeller Brothers Fund. I also direct the Racial Justice Initiative here. Um, what that means is I have the honor of directing grant making um, nationally, but we also at the Rockefeller Brothers Fund as our home jurisdiction have a particular interest in the democratic practice here in New York City. And so we also work with many, many organizations, including Beta NYC, um, as part of our democratic infrastructure here in the city. Um, my personal background is as a voting rights attorney. I also teach uh, political science courses at Columbia University in the SEPA program, and, um, and I'm a poll worker. So I'm actually really excited to be here and feel I'm a big part of the civic life of the city of New York. Um, thanks so much. Jamila? Thank you so much, Keisha. And hi, No. I'm Jamila Rose. I'm the Deputy Public Advocate of Civic and Community Empowerment here at the Office of the New York City Public Advocate. Before I even go into further details, I do apologize on behalf of the Public Advocate, who will be with us shortly. Um, my role here at the Public Advocate's Office is largely to look at um, voting infrastructure, voting rights, governmental operations, and other forms of democracy across our city, and how do we create pathways that are more equitable for all residents and not just some. Also, I focus on immigrant justice and also Black maternal and Black reproductive health. So I'm really excited to be here this evening. Um, just to answer a couple of questions before we turn it over into like the meat of the program. And I'll hand it back over to you. Well, I think we are at the main course here. So um, it's great to be with both of you on this wonderful digital stage. Um, so first, democracy. Let's try to frame this weird word that we throw around quite frequently. 
you know, to, to many, democracy is an act executed through a variety of actions. And like most people know democracy when they go into the poll site and either nominate someone to run for a, a you know, for the general election, or they actually vote for them to represent them for some set of terms. But, you know, for me, uh, in my work, uh, looking at how kind of technology and data and design practices like empower government, to me, democracy is actually a practice. It's like a muscle flexed every day by millions of people who engage in a variety of of activities from attending community board meetings, informing themselves about what's happening within a community, filing a 301 service request, organizing neighbors to ask for better services, possibly even running for office or providing feedback on how services are run. Like all of these are activities or acts of democracy. Um, I would love for both of you to take an opportunity to tell us how you define democracy either in your role um, professionally or personally uh, as you are members of you know this democratic society so i'd like it so as we think about this i'm going to frame this in the in terms of how we do our work here at the rbf and the first thing i want to point out is we don't have a democracy program we have a democratic practice program and that really looks at our democratic systems how do things work things like ranked choice voting um, you know, how do people show up at the polls? What's our election administration practices um, and all these other pieces, plus our democratic culture and how the democratic culture comes together to meet our democratic systems is our democratic practice. How do we as New Yorkers practice democracy as you really re already re referred to now? And really thinking about not just what are the mechanisms, not just showing up, um, on quote unquote election day and primary day and all these other issues that happen, but really saying how do people engage around the issues that affect them most and understanding how to intervene um, in ways that impact the lived experiences of people's lives. Great, Jamila? Yeah, and, and I think similar um, to what both of you have already said, when we think about democracy, a lot of times people tend to focus on registering people to vote or getting people to the polls and like that's a part of it like the voting portion of democracy is the foundation of it but also if we're really looking at democracy and democratic participation and practice we have to look at all the different ways that we collect voices from those who are the most marginalized and how do we take those voices how do we synthesize that information that data analyze it and then use it to then create legislation policy and practices that then increase um, equity in our city. And so democracy can be attending a community board meeting, like was said before, it could be also participating in a protest. It could be something as simple as making a 311 complaint and calling and saying sanitation was not picked up or the catch basin is overflowing. You know, it's like those are all parts of ways that collectively we contribute towards democracy to make our city safer, to make our cities run more efficiently, and um, also just to make sure that we have more equitable le legislation and policy. Great, yeah, I thank think, you. No, to, to piggyback yeah. on that, mm -hmm. um, people often say they're not political, right? And in the very next breath, they're going down to, to advocate for their kid at school, or they're saying something to the manager at their grocery store, this and the other. All of these things are acts of democracy, voice, elevating your voice to stand up for yourself, your family, your community. And when we talk about voting, that is a mechanism by which we translate that into the ballot and to elect leaders. But that is only the small, a very small portion of what our entire democratic practice, how people engage and helping folks really, really see that the act of saying, I matter, my community matters, my family matters, is all a thread within being both a political actor with like not this a political actor exercising your power in the community and recognizing how you can flex that power. Um, we care about power a lot at the RBF, so you'll hear me bring that up. Um, but really saying, what does that mean? And how do we engage around that? Yeah. And, you know, I think what's interesting about the public advocates role is that in our city charter, which was uh, deemed unconstitutional back in 1989 and there was a savvy group of new yorkers who saw an opportunity to reorganize city government and to put a literally a an advocacy individual inside of city hall well 
right next to it, but still has the powers inside of City Hall. Um, um, and so I think it's very interesting to look at what the charter says about the public advocate. Uh, Jamila, do you want to give a brief introduction of what the public advocate does? Like, what's the charter responsibilities? Yeah, I, I can go into a little bit of that. Um, we we do much more, <laughs> but yes. So one of the major things, one of the one, one of the major functions of our office, of course, is to be an, an ombudsman to the city of New York. So we're the mediator. We're bet we're between the residents of the city of New York and the government of the city of New York. So we have a whole constituent services team that's just there to hear complaints and to help people process information. Um, we're also there to legislate. We're, we're not the city council, but we do preside over the city council and we can create, um, draft and introduce bills into law. And we do that. Actually, the public advocate has more pieces of legislation than all previous former public advocates combined. So we do that quite well. And then also um, we have an advocacy arm of our office. And so we, in, in this particular iteration of this public advocate um, of New York City, we work very, very closely with activists and advocates and with grassroots community-based organizations because the public advocate himself you know, comes from the grassroots. And so we feel like when those solutions are created at a grassroots level and we're hearing what people have to say, those who are most impacted, those who are um, most marginalized, those who've been silenced, who've been historically um, disenfranchised. If we're hearing what they have to say and then we're taking that information in and we're creating policies and legislation based on it, then we can actually move forward, move the city forward. So we do a lot of that. Um, we actually submit reports to the city of New York and a few other things as well that are less sexy to talk about on the on this call right here, but um, all of it helps us move forward. We're also charter cops. So we're also the agency that has to actually be a watchdog. Um, we get, we get, that's what we get to do. We get to look at what the agencies are doing. Um, if they're not um, communicating, if they're not interfacing with the public correctly, if they're not providing enough information for the public, we step in as that watchdog and we're able to then make some noise and, and the public advocate does that well. <laughs> I mean, it's 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 really an amazing like uh, when I think about the charter being the constitution of the city, I think it's an amazing position uh, for us to have. Right. It's a very unique set of powers um, that can really shape uh, our democracy and hold government accountable from being within government. Um, and uh, yeah, I just. I, since I landed in New York City, I've been engaged with the public advocate's office one way or another, uh, trying to get people in as the public advocate, arguing with public advocates, fighting with public advocates. So it's 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 been a I, I really enjoy the role of the public advocate. Um, and I'm going to keep on saying that several times over. Um, and I, I would love to bring in uh, Keisha in regards to like, so you're a funder, you're part of philanthropy. So, you know, why is philanthropy involved and why, are, why is philanthropy passionate about democracy? We are passionate about philanthropy. So philanthropy sits within civil society, right? So we are not government, nor are we like the market, the business market, right? Philanthropy exists in a place to support civil society, um, organizations, neighborhood groups, um, community advocates to, to, support, to support that work as people define the challenges for themselves, they solve their problems, that as we look at communities as not as, you know, vulnerable targets, but as intelligent collectives that understand the problems that, that they have to face can define their own solutions. And how do we help support by funding organizations that work in and with community to advance their goals? And, and we recognize that we can't have a functioning democracy without a strong civil society. That includes reporting, that includes data information, that includes um, public agencies. It includes all kinds of spaces where we can work either in partnership um, or directly as funders. And we just see that as a, a huge and important part. Um, and there's some folks who, who come at it through very specific ways. You'll see a lot of philanthropy funding, housing or other um, advocacy, advocacy groups are issue specific. Um, but we have chosen our intervention here at the Rockefeller Brothers Fund to be around democratic system structures and democratic culture. And just to stick with you for one follow up on this, I mean, I love your background. You're, I, I can't imagine you, you seem to be like literally plucked from the heavens uh, to be brought here to New York City when it talks about your role. Minneapolis, in actually, but that's that's close. 
Uh, I hear they have a lot of good bike lanes over there and a lot of great bike infrastructure. Um, but your history of being with the League of Women Voters and then following up by being at the Brendan Center, you know, how has your history of being an advocate helped your role within philanthropy? Um, I mean, you started off by talking about that you were also a poll watcher. So um, how, how is your lived experience? I mean, you're also a trial attorney, right? A civil trial attorney. So how, I don't practice right now, but yes. How, you know, how living all of these lives um, and walking through these different worlds, um, how has that helped kind of better frame your understanding of what uh, democracy should be and how the Rockefeller Brothers Fund should be funding or supporting different types of democratic practices? Sure. Um, the organizations I've worked with have really advocated for democ as, democracy for democracy's sake. The idea and notion that our systems and processes much work for everyone. And that is deeply challenged in our current systems. One of the things we often think about is, are the systems that were designed hundreds of years ago adequate to the task of fully um, integrating and thinking about and um, being fully measurably inclusive for all folks as we sit here today? Um, are we leveraging our digital opportunities? Are we leveraging um, the systems that are necessary? Are our are our oversight institutions a little bit antiquated? And how do we think about those things? Um, my work as a voting rights attorney, um, working both with technical assistance with election administration, and also um, literally suing places and suing people um, along with my colleagues at the Brennan Center to actually ensure and protect rights at the ballot um, have been a big part of that history to understand how rights are the importance and how hard it is to maintain and protect rights. Um, the League of Women Voters, an incredibly important organization among many um, that work to inform community, um, that help people understand. I know when I first moved to New York, I turned to the League and was like, will somebody please explain to me why there's city council and borough presidents and like, and a public advocate. And what are all these layers of government? What do they do? And by the way, what's this community board thing? How do these all fit together to actually govern? And what does that mean? And I will correct you. Um, while I have been known to be a poll watcher in other jurisdictions, actually in New York City, I am a poll worker. I am one of those people that help you figure out, like, if you're in the wrong polling location, how do we do it? We get that ballot and get it out the door. Um, and these are long days. And there's a lot of people who've been doing it a lot longer than I have. Um, but it's also to me very important to see that work on the ground. It is very difficult to look at a report or just to kind of do these things and be like, I'm going to sit here in my little office and be like, this is how we're going to help improve things. We have to get out. We have to be in the people. We have to be a part of the systems. We have to see what's going on. And from those vantage points, we can help work with advocates like the city advocate, like borough presidents and others who are really working hard to create um, the kind of New York that we want to see and that ability for us to engage effectively um, as partners. And as you noted, Noel, sometimes as, as opponents, but that's the big part of accountability and that's a big part of the work. So that's that's been my experience um, and how each of these things helped me come to a place where um, we've been able to leverage resources to really continue to improve democracy in the United States here and in New York City. Thank you. Uh, I want to recognize uh, the public advocate for coming in. Thank you, sir, for joining us. Uh, thank you for all the great work that you do and, and the fight that you were just at um, getting, uh, making sure that the unions um, have proper representation. Um, so we're talking about democracy. We're talking about um, kind of like, what does democracy look like? Um, would you like to introduce yourself real quickly and just frankly say, what does democracy mean to you? Uh, uh, thank you so much. Can you hear me? Yes. All right, peace and blessings, love and light, and, and thank you, Noel and, and Beta NYC, just for the work you've been doing uh, and joining with with the office. Uh, thank you, Keisha, for taking some time out, and I saw uh, Jamela, who was on here, for, uh, filling in a little bit. I appreciate that. Sorry about being late. And just want to shout out my team, uh, John Cadden, and all the data tech team for just the amazing work they've been doing with this office and really uh, broadening what we get involved with and, and pushing in just amazing ways. So I just want to thank him them you and everybody who's looking uh, i think the most important thing uh, uh when talking about democracy is making sure that folks you know we we hear this but it's true it's not a spectator sport uh, and so sometimes and it's probably been said you you cast a ballot and then uh you walk away 
Um, and that's really not the way it, we can make the change that we need. It's really staying on top of folks and being involved. I heard Keisha speaking about community boards, uh, priests and council board, but uh, understanding what that is and the impact. And sometimes we have trouble just getting folks to come out and vote if it's not a presidential election. And so that's one uh, issue in of itself. Um, but after that, you know, you pull the lever and think it's over. Um, and that's not it. So democracy is really understanding that, you know, people will say, I'm not involved in politics, but you are. Uh, from the moment you wake up to the moment you come home, everything you do is all about politics. And so it's really just about staying involved, uh, taking advantage of the vote. Uh, but in between that time, uh, holding uh, folks accountable, understanding it's not it's not ever going to be just up to me. It wasn't just up to uh, Obama. It was up to us uh, to hold him and others accountable. Uh, and we didn't do that, I don't think. And we don't very often. You, 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 you launched right into a question that I, I was, I was saving for later. But since we're uh, halfway through this, and and here you are, I'm, I'm going to be very frank and just ask, like, how should we hold government accountable? Um, it's, it's very important to hold government accountable one by voting. <laughs> so you should very much come out and vote. And I can tell you, for being in the rooms where people aren't. Uh, we should uh, hold people accountable uh, by coming out and vote. Very often, the louder the vote, the more people pay attention. Uh, but in between time, people should really find ways to engage with their elected official. As was mentioned, I don't think people even understand the community boards, understand uh, the precinct council boards. And so when I was a council member, you know, people would say, uh, I would never see you. And then I would say, well, where did you want to see me? Uh, because... I had at that point about 160,000 constituents. I said, if I shook 130,000 hands personally, there'd be 30,000 people who say they never saw me. So I do have a role to play to make sure I'm getting the information out. Uh, but if you're not going to the places uh, where we're going to be all the time, sometimes you have to do that uh, as well and hold yourself accountable. Um, and you know, all of us, however, have a, a role to play, including uh, the Office of the Public Advocate and making sure we get better mechanisms uh, to communicate with people. So it is a two-way a two -way street, uh, making sure we're here talking about data, making sure data is really accessible, making sure that commissions are not meeting at times when people are at work, trying to figure out a way for a government not to have meetings while people are at work and have a, a way for people to, uh, to uh, come online. And so there's different things that we have to do, but really it's intentionality. It's intentionality. And sometimes that intention is not there. And part of that might be because um, there hasn't been much uh, repercussion uh, for not making the intentionality there. So it's something that we have to hold folks accountable, including myself for. Um, well, to hold you accountable, I'm looking forward to your first Copic meeting. I'm just going to put yes. that out there. Yes, sir, yes. Sir, it's really important that we have Copic. Uh, Copic is the Commission on Public Information and Communication. It's one of the ways that we hold Do It and 311 and a bunch of different websites uh, accountable. So, um, no, you're, you're correct. And thank you for, for, for bringing up Copic. I was going to uh, bring it up myself, but you, you're 100% right. Um, and, you know, John Cat is one of the biggest uh, Copic pushers in the office. And so we're really trying to find a way to, to make that happen. And you yourself uh, have been really big on that. So I appreciate it we got to make it happen. So just to follow up on this line, you have, you know, you appoint people to commissions, right, that are that are citywide, that have a mixture of that are appointed by, you know, sometimes the mayor, sometimes we're a president. Um, how what what is that role within the public advocate of appointing people to these various commissions? You know, how do you help ensure that those commissions are meeting um, and that they're holding government accountable? Um, particularly with a type of government or a mayor that seemingly doesn't want to be held accountable for regardless of, of, of their actions. Well, it's interesting. I look at this a, a little different than people might think, whether it's CCRB or the, uh, uh, the, um, the City Planning Commission. So uh, there was a gentleman by the name of Lou Fiddler, may he rest in peace. He, he, uh, he vetted me. He made sure I had the right credentials. And he put me on the community board. And after that, he never asked me to vote anyway, uh, even as we disagreed on many, many things. And I always respected that. And so I, I kind of follow that model. I try to vet people who I think will uphold government the way I think government should be upheld. Um, and we make sure that they have uh, the kind of vision that we have for government. 
um, and we make sure there's diverse voices in government because often uh, there isn't. And then we we try to find that diversity uh, and match it with uh, the committees and commissions that we have. And then the, the, what we really do is check in from time to time, make sure that things are going right. Is the support that we can do? Is the things that we should know about? But, but I actually generally don't say, you know, vote this way, vote that way. But if there's egregious things happening, then we have to figure out whether somebody gets uh, reappointed. But I think we've done a good job for the most part of making sure people's visions align. And then they just have a, a job to do after that. Great. Thank you. Um, Keisha, in our preparation, some of the conversations that we had were uh, around three questions. Um, one is how, how do we hold, how should we hold government accountable? Um, who should we be measuring or how, how should we be measuring the services that government is providing? And then um, who should we actually attempt to serve? Um, in your role at RBF, um, how do you look at measuring an organization's ability to make democracy better? How do you sure. help them set up those, those, those goals? So one of the big things with philanthropy is we are well in a position to provide resources. We are not in a position to define the work um, in that specific kind of way. When we look at organizations, we look at their mission, then we look, to look at their goals. And we also say, look, what are your benchmarks for success? How are you defining what it is that you're seeking to do based on the mission of your organization? And how are you able to meet those metrics? And those things become important. We're talking on an individual to individual level. But of course, I think, Noel, you're talking about something that's a little bit broader. It's how do we think about impact on a broader scale with our democracy? How do people feel heard? How do people talk about these spaces? And I think um, public advocate Williams touched on some really important things about how we communicate out this, that, and the other. One of the things that we feel is super important is not just how do we define what people need to hear, but how do we listen? And making sure our technology has feedback loops so people can not just hear what elected officials have to say, but elected officials can hear what people have to say and have the opportunity to be heard. This is a huge city with an enormous number of constituents and the ability for those constituents to be heard means that we have to set up mechanisms to do so. And recognizing that leadership by listening is just as important as leadership by talking. And how do we support mechanisms, organizations, and people trying to be a part of that informally and formally? How do we help people understand that community boards, it's great if you know somebody to be appointed, but there's also public seats on community boards. And there's other ways to get on, to have access, to hold accountable that are more direct to the people. And that's not always clear and obvious in a city like New York that has a lot of structures, a lot of systems that feel very, very complicated to people. Um, but I do think that there has been, I mean, great strides. Some of the amazing reports put out by the Public Advocates Office, including um, the zoning report <laughs> to address racial disparity, to look at other all these things that really look at how do these public offices actually impact the day-to-day -day life and then present opportunities for the intervention for the public. And so for us, our role says those things have to be distilled. There's a lot of organizations like Beta NYC, like Legal Women Warriors, like others that take information from the public sphere, distill it, put it into a form that those folks can use it to hold government accountable. And we think it's very important to make sure that those inf that, that infrastructure in our civil society is healthy, is robust, and is able to is able to support that kind of work. And that's everything from organizing groups and direct and, and direct activism. Um, I'm sure public <laughs> public advocate Williams wants to see people standing up holding himself accountable, just like he wants to stand and hold other levels of government accountable. And how do we do that? And what is that push, pull, and flow? Because ultimately what it boils down to for us is, what is the impact on the lived experiences of people's lives? If indeed these systems and processes do not yield meaningful opportunities to hold to be responsive, in connection with people using formal systems like voting, then we have to continue to think. We have to continue to iterate together. We have to continue to innovate together to be responsive to where we are today. So we see less of less than a million people showing up to vote for one of the most powerful offices in the, in the state of New York, certainly in the city of New York, when there are 5.5 million eligible voters. What does that look like? What does it mean? And how do we, how do we help people understand the relevance of that activity? to their rent, to their jobs, to the schools, all, all the things, to garbage pickup, all the things that are about the quality of life. 
And so that's how we sort of see like how we talk about measurement. Um, and it's a tough thing because it does get entangled with spaces that we're not allowed to function in. We do not, we cannot electioneer, we cannot support candidates. And so we really do have to think about how we support people and how we enable people to be more effective in the space. That, that speaks a lot about co-creation, right? Like, like it's, it's like figuring out how do we build systems that enable policymakers and neighbors to come together and have a conversation, ideally not argue like at a community board meeting, uh, but, you know, like actually get to the substance of the issue and, and, and then kind of, kind of meditate and then, and then move and then, and then be able to put that policy into action or possibly even experiment. Um, do either of you two have, um, examples of kind of like prototypes um, where democracy kind of was taken from the neighborhood door to door level that then was able to move forward and be to, able to scale? Um, you know, like, um, do you have examples of nonprofits or, or specific uh, um, campaigns that started local that were then able to experiment, uh, get people's feedback and then grow? You know, for me, most of what I've done for my entire electoral career has been a co-creation of policy and a co-creation of government. And it's what's been able to, you know, even fuel success. And I always try to point out because, you know, the status quo way of doing things in politics isn't usually co-creation. It's other ways that I think are actually harmful and people kind of see, you know, being on the street or being quote unquote activist. Uh, as a pathway that doesn't work. And I think we've been able to show that it actually does. And we've been able to do much more than people thought simply by the power of having the folks behind you. Uh, and the, the best example I had for a while was the Community Safety Act when we dealt with the abuses of uh, Stop, Question, and Frisk uh, when there was legislation brought to us by uh, Communities United for Police Reform that had been worked on by their members. Uh, we managed to do that at a very difficult time, uh, and we managed to override a mayoral veto. Uh, but even as uh, I'm doing now, working on the Black Maternal Health Package, uh, it, it came from community. It also came from making sure I had a diverse uh, team of people, because I'm not sure that that package would have been uh, as prioritized it is, as it is if I hadn't had uh, the diversity that we had uh, in our team Lo and behold, it actually has been uh, more personal to me than I thought it would be even when we started introducing it. Uh, but uh, if you look at the work we're doing uh, for transgender now conforming uh, New Yorkers, again, having diversity of people on the team are important. The racial impact study came directly for Treasury United for Fair Housing and their member organization. So staying close to the ground is really important. We actually redesigned the public advocate's office to actually be more, uh, you know, the, the previous public advocate was an attorney and she had a very uh, focused mind on litigation. As a community organizer, I came in with that mindset. And so uh, the largest part of our office is community engagement. So we're able to hear directly from folks and people are able to hear directly from us. Uh, and that's uh, what I actually believe co-governance should be, what government should be. A lot of times folks get elected and think um, that it's really just about them. And, and that's unfortunate. We've had so much measured success and I'm hoping people understand that model. Um, you know, we, we have a model similar when it comes to public safety and gun violence that has also been tremendously successful and got us to where we were in 2018, 2019, uh, which is the numbers that people compare, uh, compare to. And if we're not careful, we'll get away from that uh, as we're seeing the spike in violence going on now. But the co-creation of governments and public safety is a really important conversation to have. Keisha, would you like to take that question as well? I, I can't imagine being able to add on. Um, I think those are really great examples of how things move from, from, from a notion in the street to actually what it takes to mandate. And I think what's actually incredibly important here is the partnership level. I think the, the public advocate's office demonstrates something 
that we believe in very deeply, which is the partnership between civil society and electeds. Um, what does it mean to take ideas that are born and then have elected officials that are able to carry that forward? Um, notions of not just public policy, but fiscal policy. How does it just not, how does it just happen, right? Um, for us, one of the things we like to do is we like to support um, innovation and ideas. But to support these ideas, we have to know that there's a pathway that there are elected officials that are gonna say, hey, look, if this pilot works, let's carry it forward. Um, and if it shows up someplace, it shows up, we're gonna be able to carry it forward. Oh, and there's a budgetary model that actually supports it. It's not just a notion of an interesting idea, but actually a way to say we can take this from proof of concept to real life. And those, those things are few and far between, they're hard to do. Um, and I think that an orientation around um, community advocacy and um, activism I think does bring, I think, a certain lens to the table. And I say that as an attorney who does believe in suing people to get them to do the right thing at times, um, but recognizing that all of this um, is part of a really important network and system of strategies that are effective. And so um, I was about to say I had nothing to add, but then I had it, didn't I? <laughs> I, I, I just want to add, and I appreciate that. And I, litigation is important, so we need all the tools. Uh, but one of the things that you mentioned, you know, with the pilot program, the way we got to where we are now with uh, our cure violence model and the mayor's office of uh, gun violence prevention actually came from a pilot of a task force I chair where we and there was a fiscal impact we went from about five million to about over 40 million right now and there's another pilot we're trying to overlay over that uh, so I'm a big supporter of pilots unfortunately many times what happens is it becomes pet projects of elected officials um, there's no intense evaluation with which is really important to be able to evaluate and make things evidence-based and then expand it. And so those are models that I think are very helpful and unfortunately uh, are, are much fewer and far between um, than I think um, people uh, actually realize. And when you talk about data and the use of data, you know, being having a user-friendly space when it comes to the city budget is also important. There just really isn't one. And, uh, you know, Copic is, it can be part of that, but there are other places where we can actually be more user friendly. The budget is probably the most important thing that uh, definitely the city council does, but, but government does in general. And it's the thing people understand the least. And a lot of these conversations happen uh, when people are at work and lingo that people don't understand. Uh, we had a bill uh, that we passed on the city council that actually made for the first time uh, many of the funding that happen to community groups go online. Uh, but that in and of itself sometimes is difficult to navigate. Uh, and I often think government uh, tries its best not to make it as easy as possible uh, to confuse folks. Uh, but it's our job who really believe in this stuff to push government, including myself and folks who get in here, to make that thing more accessible. I think if folks really understood the budget, um, it'll be so much more powerful for the, the things uh, many people believe in and think are being funded and think are being structured, uh, but really aren't in the way they think they are. And I think that's been a big part of some of the advocates that we funded and worked with, whether it's WEACT, ACRE, um, Beta NYC, who have really recognized the importance of understanding where the funding flows where the funding disappears. Um, what happens when it's originally allocated and then when it comes down the pike, it's like what happened to that? You know, we're gonna be facing trillions of dollars coming from the federal government that can be directed to local activities. It is going to be incredibly important that New Yorkers really have a strong sense of where that money potentially can go. What are the programs that are being funded? How do those look like? How do they show up? and how they work in different ways, everything from cooperatives to data opportunities, um, all this is part of this infrastructure bill and the ability to be able to say, hey, wait a minute, city level or even state level politicians, this has to flow to communities. This has to show up in a way that's meaningful for people most impacted and the ability to be able to speak to the relationship between state federal budgets is really a huge part of the funding structure and the infrastructure that we fund. And Keisha, that was the first hard question that you asked me was in our very first meeting was, what are you doing to make the city budget more accessible and transparent? And how are you helping 
and and that is a question that is seared in my head um, and every single week I think about what exactly are we doing to make these budgetary numbers more transparent and I'm really really excited that on January 1 uh, public advocate Williams uh, will have an ally in that in that the comptroller uh, um, comptroller lander uh, comptroller elect Brad Lander um, is is also very interested in making the city budget um, machine readable in a way that will hopefully help us make it more accessible and we can make tools to demystify how our city prioritizes um, its policy through its budget, which is really, really opaque. Um, speaking and about the budget is a moral document. It's not just a absolutely. set of numbers. It is not just it is a moral and equitable document and ace. And one of the ways we know that systems are immoral in my reading is asymmetry of information. When information is held in one place and denied in another, that is um, that to me is at first blush. I said, there's something wrong here. There is something wrong. And the idea of saying, how do we look at, how do we engage in around symmetry of information? Um, you know, data is the, you know, is a civil rights landscape for the 21st century. And making sure that people truly understand what needs to happen, I think, is incredibly important. And we're really thrilled to have advocates like uh, Advocate Jamani really being excited and centering in on some of these questions. Well, I, I look at the the myriad of tools that were launched and kind of um, uh, emergency measures, whether it was um, food access tools or it was the, the COVID testing sites or it was the vaccine finder. Um, and to see that like all of these tools were stood up really, really rapidly, but then never user tested for people who have site limitations, um, who uh, don't use English as their primary language. I mean, it just, it's painful because I look at the contracts and I see millions of dollars. And I see millions of dollars to build tools that are inaccessible to some of the most vulnerable New Yorkers. And then they've result to having to call 311. And then in 311, we've seen this explosive growth in calls to 311, where the hold time is is minutes long. And so it's just it's it's heartbreaking knowing that in the 21st century we have the tools and we have the capability if you're willing to work with the constituents um, to make these things work better. Um, and so. you know, what was even mo more frustrating during particularly those early days um, of getting vaccines and trying to figure it out, it wasn't even government that had the best websites to be able to do that. It was a community that came together and really started pushing that information now, uh, out, really showing the failure uh, of government, uh, which is one. And then two, uh, sometimes, a government tries to purposefully obfuscate uh, the data. We found that when we were trying to figure out who was getting tested and who was getting vaccine, it took a while to get that information. And, and as we thought they were, it was the same communities that usually have access to the, less access to the data and usually being hit harder uh, that were getting tested less and getting um, vaccinated less and actually were having less opportunity to get those things. And so even you know from dealing way back when with the abuses of stop, question, and frisk, the only reason we were able to do that it's because someone passed a law that actually made them have to document how many stops were there. Without that data, we wouldn't have been able to address it. Without the data of who was getting tested and who wasn't, we wouldn't have been able to point things in the right direction. And so it just shows the incredible power that data actually has on public discourse, but also on public policy. And very often, uh, you know, community groups step in uh, where uh, government fails, which is unfortunate. Uh, but it's a double edge because we should be funding more of those groups actually uh, to fill the gap. So I would love to just chime in here a little bit, and I'm going to pick up on a word you used, um, Noel, vulnerable, and relate that, I think, to what Public Advocate Williams was saying. One of my least favorite words is vulnerable. Um, a lot of, particularly in terms of communities. To my mind's eye, vulnerability is an infantilizing term. It's often used around children. Children are vulnerable. Um, the, but the idea of saying communities are vulnerable, communities are not vulnerable. Communities are, as collectives, understand the challenges, know how to solve their problems. If asked, they can tell you what they need. What communities are, are targeted. They're targeted for over-policing. They're targeted for underfunding. They're targeted for undereducation. And it's the data that helps us tell that story. It's the data that helps us say, and 
and that's incredibly important because the solutions change. If I'm trying to solve a problem for a targeted community, the solutions are deeply different than if I'm trying to solve problems for someone who's vulnerable and needs to be taken care of. It's something else to be able to say, how do we solve problems for communities that are targeted? We can show it with data, we can lift it up, and we can take that information and say, this is what needs to change about actions, about places, and it's about outcomes, and it's about specificity, and it's not generalized notions of like protecting people from themselves or outside spaces. And so I, I think that is one reason why the data is so important, and, and it is about reframing from notions of vulnerability of collectives to what it means to have an otherwise healthy, intelligent, thriving community of black and brown folks, of folks with disabilities, of other folks within our communities that are not vulnerable, who know what they need. And if we're able to ask them, if we're able to use technology and other systems to listen, if we're able to use the data to measure the impacts upon these communities, we can solve the problems that are actually happening and just not notions of discourse that have been worn into our brains through years and years of politicking. And we, we tend to listen to communities when we want to. And so uh, something that was mentioned is a great example of that public safety. Um, and we have an increase in gun violence that's undeniable it's happening around the country. So we have to really address that. How we address that is really important. Uh, we've done a lot of work around this, but very often in defense of over-policing, what people will say is, well, the communities are asking for more police. And very often that is a true statement. Um, one, we've been trained to think that's the only thing uh, that, that could uh, respond in some cases. But more accurately, I often say that is true, but they've also asked for the other things they need because they know what they need. We just haven't listened to them. So they've also asked for uh, safe, affordable housing. They've asked for better food options. They asked for better access to health care, mental health services. They asked for uh, better education facilities. And for some reason, we don't hear them on that. Uh, and the, the same money we spend on uh, the police department, uh, we won't spend on other agencies. Uh, and then we, we talk about what the communities need. And so we tend to listen to, to certain things and, and not others uh, when, it, when it suits us. Um, thank you for both of those very important comments on this. Uh, you know, I'm reflecting on something that happened last week at Cornell Tech um, in the conversations that we were having about uh, community, it was a recognition that we're not dealing in the work that we do around digital literacy, Beta NYC, digital and data literacy, there's not one community, there are communities, right? Like there are a variety of communities, there's not a, a monolithic community and that, and every single community has its own digital divide, it has its own data divide, it, it has its own um, set of issues that need to be worked with um, to ideally position them into a place of power and respect at the same table that they're getting the resources that other privileged communities have gotten in the past. Um, and so, um, Keisha, in our preparations, you brought up something that I do want to try to touch on before this conversation ends, which is that when we talk about data that, you know, we want to build data informed societies, we want to leverage data and be informed so that way we're speaking from an authoritative truth, because, you know, we have these numbers that tell us these things. Um, but as you pointed out, like, some of these data sets are inaccurate and we're dealing with a really big national data set that has some fuzzy numbers attached to it you know what what should we be thinking about in the next few years and possibly work with for the next decade um around data sets that are not as accurate as they should be or could be, particularly the census data. Um, mm -hmm. And then uh, Jumani, I would love to know, you know, how do we um, how do we build community data sets that are informed from the public um, and that are not necessarily the purely authoritative things that are in the open data portal? Yeah, I think as we think about data, I think you've named something that's really important. Um, there's some real questions about how this census turned out, how people were able to engage so much confusion with the prior um, uh, White House administration. Um, and it really did impact how numbers were counted and how many people disappeared. Um, and the question, and these are essential numbers, right? This is how we do budget 
projections. This is how we know if there's a FEMA crisis, how many trailers are going to send, how people are helped, because this is the number of people we think are here. And when these numbers are really, really off, they're really, really damaging. And so it's our hope that both government and civil society will start to think about what are the alternative data sets that exist at the municipal and state levels that can either backfill or redefine recognizing that we frequently use school registration data. And we know from recent interviews, this New York City public schools still don't even know how many students there are in school yet, let alone being able to use this as a backup data set, which is frequently used because of the impacts of the, the pandemic and the, 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 the lockdown and how that has affected New Yorkers. So there's really a lot of open questions, while at the same time, the Department of Commerce right now is in conversations with its frames, frames program to talk about what are those alternative data sets at the federal and state level that they're gonna to start to use and start to think about possibly to even backfill official census numbers starting in 2030. These conversations are happening now. And the ability to have those conversations, to intervene on those conversations and for cities like New York that are deeply dependent on accurate census counts to be able to stand up and say, this is what we need to do. This is what we need to see. In addition to just being engaging in our complete count committees to get people counted, to actually say not everyone's going to be counted, but there are databases, there are participatory, um, there are systems and processes that people participate in that really help us inform how many people there really are and who's using what, where, and when in the city. You know, it's, it's interesting. I, I, I always love this example of uh, people and organizations who are putting together youth youth uh, youth events, who, who are putting together youth forums and, and programming, but have no young people uh, at the table designing those things. Uh, and so we see those things that happen a lot when people are doing things for communities, but don't have the community themselves involved in the planning stages of it. Uh, and so uh, too often people are uh, working off false data and they're also designing ways to get that information from communities without the community members who are really on the ground uh, to tell you what to do. And, and so you may go to, you know, some of the top level, quote unquote, spokespeople of those communities. You may even go to the elected official. Um, but what you really need to do is be speaking to people on the ground who understand what's happening. You also have to do it with empathy for those communities. And so as angry as I was and still am about people not filling out the census, having to communicate that understanding that black and brown communities, uh, usually when government is knocking on their door and asking for information, it's not a good thing. And so you have to just talk to them with that empathy and probably not show up looking like you're a government trying to get information. Um, and we knew that from early on, uh, but didn't get the funding to the community groups who actually can get in there uh, and have the sensitivities to get the information. Uh, and so we really uh, have to work on that a lot sooner. When we did, we did a remarkable job, those communities did. Um, and it was frustrating because uh, the, the vaccine hesitancy um, was with the same communities. And I was pushing both the governor and the mayor to reactivate that same network of people. And yet they refused. And they tried all these other measures. And I'm like, you have people who have shown you they can get into these communities and you still won't activate them. And so we have to do a better job meeting communities where they are and engaging with them where they are. Uh, because trying to engage with them where you want them to be uh, doesn't work, especially where you want them to be. Uh, you understand why they're not there, the historic reasons, the historic disinvestment, and take the time. It's, it's not an easy thing to do, but it's something that we have to do. Uh, and it just takes the willingness and intentionality to to get that done. Thank you. Um, with the with the few minutes that were remaining, um, this is the pie in the sky magic wand question. Um, we know that the next city council is going to be historic. It's going to be one of the most diverse legislative bodies in America, and it's going to be the first female majority city council that the city has ever seen. Um, so what are, yes, absolutely. I'm, I'm super excited to see what this city council does. And it's a really unique one because they've got two years to prove their case. Then they got to fight again for two years, uh, and then they can run again for a, a, four, a, a full four-year term. So with this kind of like um, 
challenge um, that the council will face with a really strong mayor and essentially a council term that's going to that might be divided in two. Um, you know, what are your hopes and aspirations with the most diverse city council um, that we've ever seen and the first female led uh, majority city council? I, my hopes and aspirations is that a female-led council governs the way women govern. And we know that women govern differently. We know that women have a tendency to listen better, that regardless of partisan orientation, women are more focused on housing, more focused on education, that we know that there does tend to be better um, and more effective legislation that comes out of female-led bodies. And I'm really, really hopeful hoping and believing in the New York City Council to prove that case. Um, that's what the voters wanted. That's what the voters voted for. And the ability to be able to say we are going to listen and we're going to listen in different kinds of ways that we're going to reject some of these patriarchal models. We're going to say, what does it stand up? We're going to value the feminine, both in workplaces and outside of workplaces. And we're going to stand up and say, this is what matters for New York. Uh, ditto to all of that. <laughs> uh, and having been inside there, I'm excited to see what's going to happen uh, with this new group. I haven't, uh, I think we haven't seen this kind of energy since 2009 uh, when um, uh, a group of folks who benefited from term limits and public financing came in and, and really did a number there. And it actually benefited the city in a lot of ways. Unfortunately, I think too often as you're in there, you come in with the great ideas. Uh, you start getting into the same bad habits that, of how people make decisions in those spaces, which is, you know, the argument for term limits uh, to begin with, to get some some new ideas in there. Um, you know, one thing I'm hoping folks begin to realize, which, which is what I try to do, one is the seat you're holding is now more important than the people you're representing. And two is um, often they, they dangle some things in front of you um, that are very helpful for your district. But Oftentimes, that thing they're dangling in front of you, you have to do something that hurts the entire city. And I feel like there's some more folks in there that understand that, that understand the power of sticking together and not taking the first, second thing that's dangled in front of you so you can say you did this for your district, when actually the thing that you have to do in exchange for that harms your district even more. Um, and understanding, opening up the process to democracy, opening up the process Seeding power, whether it was uh, what we did with participatory budgeting or trying to get people uh, to be able to vote easier or public financing, getting folks more involved is what we need. Uh, but it runs counter sometimes the way the way some of us electeds think, because it's mostly about incumbency protection. And I'm hoping that we have a group of folks now that really will push back on that model and make decisions on those best. Uh, for uh, the uh, people of the city. Obviously, I can't act like I'm not in the game of politics, but you got to min minimize that as much as uh, humanly possible. Um, so on the local level, uh, continuing uh, pushing for better public financing, expanding language access. Um, we also want to make sure as we're pushing the discussion of public safety, that people have the courage to really broaden that out. We spent a whole summer really focused on policing understanding that police is can never be equated to uh, public safety. It's one part, but where's the rest of the parts? Is it being structured? Is it being financed? And too often it's not. And what I hope people will go back and look at what happened before the pandemic that we had to fight tooth and nail for, but actually worked. And so I'm really excited about this council because I think they get that and the reason we've been able to have this diversity now is because of things like public financing, is because of things of, uh, like term limits. And so um, those kind of things that allow folks like myself, who is a community organizer, and didn't come through the normal ranks uh, and doesn't have access to the type of money that other folks do, uh, can really be beneficial uh, to our city. And I'm excited to see how, where I think we have an opportunity to have a body that thinks of politics as shifting power and not just political gamesmanship. Um, and that I think is something that we're really excited to see as residents of the city of New York. And of course, you know, on other levels, you spoke about the local level, but uh, things like uh, ending the filibuster, uh, things about uh, making sure on the state level people can vote. We just lost three ballot initiatives, which is crazy and ridiculous. I don't want to get into too much of the politics, but there was tremendous failures there that would have uh, gotten uh, people to vote easier. The truth of the matter is, 
uh, unless forced. Most electeds don't want to open up the process. We like to know exactly who we're talking to, uh, and we don't want to deviate from that. We got these folks that are going to get vote us in, but I think we have a group of folks, at least on the council level, that's going to push back on that. More and more, we're getting folks on the state level, uh, and of course, I'm hoping we'll have some even more change on the state level soon. Well, thank you so much, uh, Jumani and Keisha. I absolutely adore spending time with both of your brains. Um, they're some of the finest in the city. Um, so thank you for your time. I hope both of you get home safely um, and that your families don't um, hate us too much for uh, having having you with us instead of with them um, uh, this evening. Um, thank so you, thank Lord. you very much. Um, thank you, it was an honor. Thank you so much. John, I'm bringing you back onto the stage here. John, what's up, John? Thank you all, what's up? Thank you for this conversation. And I just wanna close this out by saying um, the, the conversation and the call to action does not end here. We're really, as a part of the People's Tech Assemblies and as a part of the core mission of this office, the Public Advocates Office, we're calling you to get engaged in the civic process. We need your narratives. We need your voice. We need your ideas to craft the solutions um, that are equitable and inclusive here in New York City. And, and you can do that now at People's Tech, People's Plural, as, as Noel mentioned, peoplestech.nyc. Um, join the conversation. Let us know what you're, you're experiencing. Let us, let us know what you need in your community. And um, it's going to end up in the work that our office, Beta NYC, and our, our many partners are working on. So I want to thank you all for joining us. Thank you all for the panel and, and have a good night.